Good morning. <laughs> welcome this morning to Gate City United Methodist Church. And as always, we welcome those who are live streaming and invite you down here in person to praise God with us. A uh, few announcements. Let's see here. Uh, there's a Mother's Day dinner, uh, May the 13th, which is being sponsored by the men's group. And we need to RSVP by May the 5th. And you can do that to Miss Heather. Uh, or I guess the church office as well. So, but uh, the dinner will be May the 13th at 6 p.m. Also, Camp Fort Blackmore is having the second annual Trout Derby, Saturday, April the 20th at 9 a.m. And uh, all donations go to benefit the camp. And if you've never gone to Fort, Camp Fort Blackmore, you don't know what you're missing there because it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry mm -hmm. and a fun place to be. Uh, and also get your change ready. We're collecting change this morning. And I think that goes for which box? The blessing, the blessing box. Yes. Oh. And we take cash too. For those cash checks. Like, like dollar bills, it doesn't have to be cash. It has to be, yeah, it can be. <laughs> Whatever to spare you got, we'll take it. <laughs> Are there any other special announcements this morning? I think the, uh, is the youth doing a fundraiser this evening? So the Singo. Singo Bingo is tonight. Uh, the youth are spot, the youth, yeah, it's potluck. And so please come out and for a good time. And we always have fun at our potluck dinners. So please come out and uh, support that. Uh, any other special announcements? Oh, okay. For the, cancer for the cancer center. And we can always use snacks for the cancer center, so just keep keep those coming. So United Methodist Women tomorrow night at six o'clock. Any other special announcements? Well, Miss Vicki Rasnick sent me another little I tell you what, she's supplying me it. It's really helping me out here. Uh, <laughs> says our computers went down at the office today, so we had to do everything manually. It took me 15 minutes to shuffle the cards for solitaire. <laughs> Say hello to your friends this morning. Now, as you are able, let us please rise and joyfully praise God this morning by stating what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our opening hymn, Blessed Assurance, words are on the screen if you're using your hymnal, page 369. Fanny J. Crosby, uh, who was a prolific hymn writer, and a little tidbit about Miss Crosby, she was blind her, her whole life, but she wrote some of the most beautiful hymns. Good morning. It is good to see everybody here this morning, um, and it's good to be back with you. Heather and I had a, a good getaway for her birthday, but it's good to be back this morning, and uh, just a big thanks for um, Jack Edwards for preaching last week um, as part of our connectional ministry. Jack is a, is a retired elder and a member now at First Broad Street, so it's great that we've got people that we can call on, um, both outside of the church and inside of the church, for preaching and for preaching through music, which Kristen will be doing next week uh, for us, as Heather and I will be in Chattanooga for a Southeast Jurisdiction United Women in Faith conference. Okay, a lot of words, a lot of words, but good stuff. So it is good to, to be back with everybody today. The lectionary reading uh, from the Psalms for today is Psalm 4. It's a Psalm of David. It's really a prayer. Maybe you've said something like this. Answer me when I call to you. My righteous God, give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Many, Lord, are asking who will bring us prosperity. Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. And in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Um, do we have any prayer requests or praises we want to mention together this morning? Okay, please remember Matt and Lisa this morning. And Patrice, 
uh, with her knee pain as well. Okay. Any others? Fonda Owens. Okay. All right, Moya's niece traveling back home today. Okay, Matthew Ledford. Wonderful, wonderful. So Oliver home. That's great. All right. Any unspoken prayer requests this morning? All right. Just remember on the back of your uh, pews, there's a, a card. You can always write prayer requests down on those and place it in the offering plate. Or if there's any information that you want to ask me about or get to me, that's a great way to do it as well. For everyone online, simply use the chat for that. Type in your prayer request or let me know how I can be of help to you or the church can. Let's take these prayer requests and our praises uh, to the Lord our God this morning. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. As we continue to move through the Easter season, we are mindful of the, the light of the resurrection. And God, at times we may uh, pray the way that David did, just for God, would you, would you answer us? And we feel that we need some relief. But God, we thank you that your light does indeed shine upon us, that your hand is upholding us and that your peace is offering comfort and love and grace to us in all the times of our lives. We lift up the names that we mentioned uh, aloud this morning, as well as those that we hold close to our hearts. God, may these prayers of our heart and our soul come to your throne of grace this morning, knowing that you are a responsive God and you hear us and you will act. We ask your blessing to be upon today's worship service. Allow us to set aside uh, distractions that may enter and creep into our minds, to lay aside worries that we may have brought in with us today, and to focus on the light that you offer, and to be reminded of the great love that you have for each of us. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us share the many blessings Jesus Christ has provided for us, including getting our little change out here. And uh, let's bring our gifts to God this morning.
God, we thank you for the opportunity to give. As we give this morning, we ask that your, uh, your blessing be on these gifts of our tithes and our offerings so that they may be used to further your kingdom because this is all your world and it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, if our children want to come forward. Good morning. What you got? Do what? So your sister's not here today. Well, will you tell her that we missed her? Yeah? Is there anybody else coming? Maybe. You don't think? Are y'all doing something special today? Yeah. Are we waiting on some more people? Okay. Should I go get them? Let's go see what they're doing. So Henry had an important question for me earlier, didn't you? What are we going to do after church? We're going to fill the gumball machine in the office. So in case you didn't know, there's like one of those little mini old-timey gumball machines in my office, um, which anybody can come and get. The only rule is that if you're an adult, you have to put money in it to get your gumball. And if you're a child, there's a little container of change there. But we're running out of gumballs because some days we have to get like several, don't we, Henry? So we're going we're gonna to fill that up here today. Are we doing a handbell thing, or I'm, I'm lost okay. on what's going on. All right. How are y'all doing today? Are we doing good? Good. So I've got a little bit of scripture that uh, Pastor Michael's going to read for you today, and then I'm going to ask some questions. Are y'all ready to answer some questions? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to read today from 1 John. So is 1 John in the Old Testament or New Testament? New Testament. Who wrote 1 John? John. John. Why is it called 1 John? It's the longest of his letters. So it was number one. 2 John is the second longest, and 3 John is the shortest. You guys got it. Okay, so here is from 1 John chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. All right. So raise your hand if you're a child. You can. You, you are a child. <laughs> so what are some things that you are kind of responsible for doing because you're a child? Can y'all think of anything that since you're a child that you have to do? Feed the dogs. Um, what do you have to do, Brian? Um, wait, what are you? Since you're a child, are there certain things that you have to do because you're a kid, because you're a child? Like, do your parents say this is a responsibility you have? Cleaning up. Cleaning up, especially your bedroom. So you don't have anything you have to do since you're a child? No. I do have stuff, but I'm not a child. <laughs> okay, in a minute, I'm gonna. Do you think I'm a child? No. Because in a minute, I'm gonna tell you how I am a child. Because we all are. So some of the things that you have to do, Meredith, is there anything that you have to do that's like your responsibility? No. You don't have to pick up your toys. No. I was afraid if I asked somebody about cleaning up their room, they'd be like, No, my mom cleans my room. And if your mom cleans your room, can you send her to my house? Because I need her to clean my room. So what I want to talk about is that passage says that we're all children of God. So raise your hand if you're a child of God. 
All right, I see some people not, okay, everybody's got their hand up. So all of us are children of God. And I wanted to ask you guys, what are some things that, because we're a child of God, that we should be doing? Raise your hand if you've got an answer. Praying. Praying. Anybody else? Not sinning. Not sinning. And for you, ma'am? Uh, uh, throwing food. We shouldn't throw food. Is that what you said? Okay. What about you? Is there something that you can do because you're a child of God? Come here. I'm going to show you something I can do. I'm going to give you a hug because I love you. So we're supposed to love people, right? And the, what is the most important thing that we should be doing because we're a child of God? Believing in God and loving God. That is the number one thing. That's our number one responsibility for being a child of God is loving him. And the second thing is to love other people. I see your shirt. I love it. What's on it? A dwarf and a bird and a tiger and a cat. Yeah, that's all those animals. It's And it says wild vacation on there. Yeah. So I just wanted to remind you all today that we're all children of God. God loves us so much because we are his children, and he wants us to love him and love each other. Can we do that? All right. All right. That's right. That's when you just drop the bell, Henry. Good job, man. Good job. All right, so I want to pray with you guys, and then I got bulletins for y'all, okay? So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your love for us and that we are all children of God. Help us love you and love others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, here's a bulletin for you guys. Great job. Good job. Good job, Henry.
stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an exile by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe That's our big theme for the day. If you haven't caught it yet, you're a child of God, and God has lavished his love on you. Okay? So that's the big thing I want you to know. To continue with that, we're going to look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends... Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him, purify yourselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or know him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. A few, um, or, well, I guess it was last month, um, Heather and I went to um, a minister's convocation in Pigeon Forge. We had some different speakers there, and one of the speakers was from Georgia. Her name was Ann Bassarge, and she's doing a lot of great ministry work. And one thing she talked to, to all of us preachers and, and leaders in Holston about was what she called eight mindset shifts for churches today to be um, relevant and reaching new people for Christ in the 21st century and to be healthy, vital congregations where we are. Now, I've shared some of these with our administrative board. You'll hear more about them because some of them really stick out to me. But one that I'd like to touch on today is number five, from behaving to belonging. The title of today's message is Behaving as Children of God. So we're going to start there. To behave means to act a particular way based off the situation you find yourself in. Or maybe you behave a particular way based off the people that you're around. So, so how we behave in different situations might be different. How we act around different people might be different. Are you all with me on that? Okay. Let, let's think about it in terms of church. Um, growing up as a child, which you're still a child. Isn't that beautiful? You are a child today. How wonderful is that? Growing up, though, when we are physically we were a little bit smaller and younger, were there certain things you were taught how to behave in church? 
Okay, being quiet is obviously one of them. Very good. Anybody told to be quiet? You better be quiet when we get to church. Anybody ever hear that growing up? Okay, and that's cultural, right? In some church traditions, being quiet in church would actually be very disrespectful to the worship service as well as to the preacher. I'm just saying. But other worship services, the style being quiet is, is something we're taught. Let's, let's do that again. What's something else maybe that you were taught growing up on how you need to behave in church? Don't run in the church. Okay. Sit still in the church. Anybody ever told you better pay attention in the church? Anybody ever told you better not go sleep in the church? Okay, well, maybe all these are different things that we were told on how we need to behave in church. Why were we told those things, do you think? Why were you told those things? To be respectful in the church, okay? Did you ever feel like there might be a consequence if you didn't behave the right way when you were in church? Anybody? Okay, one of my favorite memes is the, the mama who's sitting in a pew looking behind her. She's got one of those wooden spoons. And she's, she's just ready, man. And I was thinking all the things that she must have told these kids. And not, on, not just her kids, right? Because, because we're, we're responsible for everybody. Did you have not just your mom or your dad or your grandmother, but you knew there were other people in church who would make sure you were behaving the right way? Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about behaving. Sometimes we behave a particular way out of a cultural expectation. Sometimes we behave a particular way out of fear of a consequence if we don't behave that particular way. How we behave in different situations and around different people is going to be different. How we behave at a UT, well, okay, how we behave at a VT football game is going to be different probably than how we behave at the opera, right? Okay, I hope it is. I hope it is. I'm just saying. I want to propose today this that there are some people who, who do not know how to behave in church or have chosen that they don't want to be forced to behave a particular way and those people aren't going to come to church. I, I would also say those are the people that Jesus hung out with the most. The outcasts from a religious Jewish society and Jesus was not telling them to misbehave Jesus was telling them there is a better and new way to behave and that belonging is more important than behaving. What I want you to get today is not only that you're a child of God, not only that God's lavish or love has been lavished on you, but that you belong. Why don't you do that with me? Just turn, look at somebody and say you belong. Now, there are some ways I think it is appropriate to behave in certain situations, but as I read the gospel, it's not just about following the rules. It's not just about being quiet or um, paying attention or not running in church or dressing a particular way. When I read the gospels, the one thing I hear Jesus talking to us about what it means to be a child of God is there's one action that you are called to regardless, and that one action is love. To, to love God, in case you haven't heard that today, thanks Heather, love God and love other people. Now, John. John called himself the disciple that Jesus loved, and I just love that. I think we should all sign our names that way from now, all, all this week. Who are from, from Heather, the disciple that Jesus loved, right? Because you are the ones that Jesus loved. John, John um, looked at himself that way. So he's writing a letter that we have as 1 John. Not because this was the first of the letters he wrote, simply because out of the ones we have in Scripture, 1 John is what? It's the longest. That's why it's called 1 John. And he's writing to a group of, of Christians later in his life, and they're in house churches. Now, a house church simply means that someone opened their home up for a group of believers to come and to worship together. And to worship together really means these things. Number one, they shared a meal together, okay, and they, they ate together. Uh, two, they checked in with each other. How are you doing? How is it with your soul? Then they prayed for each other. They sang a hymn or more together with each other. And then they read scripture. And after the reading of scripture, either one person or more than one person would, would share what it is they were hearing from God, speaking to them through that scripture that was read. They would pray again. They may share in what we call Holy Communion. 
the, the sharing of the loaf of bread and the glass of wine, remembering the body and the blood of Christ given through his sacrifice as an offering for us so that we can live in him. Before there were grand cathedrals or multi-level church buildings, believers gathered in their homes to worship. It's a house church. It is something that I believe is actually making a comeback today. House churches are ways that people can be connected with a church even though they're not physically in the building. Now, I know that's freaking some people out already, but that's where we are in this 21st century worship. House churches can be vital congregations connected with an existing church because those people in that house church either, for whatever reason, cannot attend a particular church service. I would be fascinated for our online worshipers this morning if there's someone who feels like God is calling them to a house church. And a house church means that you'll open your home up and let other people come over and worship. Does it mean you have to clean your house every day? No, it doesn't. Does it mean you have to have everything spotless and perfect? No, it doesn't. Does it mean you have to love people and be hospitable? Yeah. And, and if there's anybody that may be interested in that, then I want to talk to you because I think that we are poised at Gate City United Methodist Church for an interesting revival of what God may do in our lives and in our, in our society and our church. And it may look a little different than we have anticipated in our mind of what it's going to look like. So a house church, I believe, is one option. We can reach new people. So that's who's John writing his letter to is these house churches. Now, he's writing to the churches. They're in modern day um, Turkey because there's been an issue, all right? And, and if you read, if you know much of different books of the Bible, most of the New Testament ones other than the Gospels were written to a particular group of people addressing a particular issue. First John is no different. First John is, write, write, or John is writing this letter to these house churches because, um, well, there, some people had left, all right? There was a schism in, in these house churches John is writing um, not to the ones who left. John is writing to the ones who stayed. Seems appropriate. As John is writing to the ones who stayed, he's not going to lay out the rules on how to follow Jesus. He's not going to give a list of all these are the things that you need to do or these are the things you don't need to do. What he's going to do is he's going to remind these people in these house churches, you are loved and you belong. So he says this. He says See what great love the Father has lavished on us. That verse has been like a wow statement to me this week. I've read it a lot of times in my life. It just hit a little different this week. Have you ever had Bible verses do that? See what great love the Father has lavished on us. I love how the New International Version translates that word of God abundant giving as lavished. Now, some people may know what the word lavish means. Um, it, I know one person would because she literally named her business that. If you don't know what lavish means, I did a little di dictionary definition for you. Lavish means sumptuously rich, elaborate, and decadently luxurious. That's how you feel when you leave Paige's shop, I bet, right? But here's the thing. John's using those words to talk about God's love. Here's the thing. God loves you. Anybody heard that before? I know you've heard it because I've been very intentional every week for like three years now to remind you every Sunday God loves you. But what I want us to do this morning is think about how do we see that lavish love of God? How do we see that um, sumptuously rich love of God? How do we see that decadently luxurious, doesn't it just sound warm? Decadently luxurious love of God. How do we see it? Because this love of God, this agape love, is the greatest love any of us will ever know. And sometimes we actually go through days, if you're anything like me, and you miss aspects of this love that God has for us. So to start with, I just want to focus on the first word, see, and how do we see God's love? I want to give you some some ideas that came to my mind, maybe you've got some others. Uh, one is through God's presence. I think we see the lavish love of God through the presence of God. In John chapter 14, Jesus told the disciples he was going to go away. Right? And as he was going, 
He had to go away, he said, because there was another that's going to come, a comforter, an advocate, one who will be with you and in you always, and that is the very Holy Spirit of God. Do you ever have days where you try to imagine the fact that the Holy Spirit is somehow in you and dwelling in you? Do you ever have days where that just blows your mind? Because as I think about that, what a beautiful way that God is showing us this lavish and decadent love, other than one, to promise to always be with us, but two, to literally be in us as his children. I think we see the lavish love of God up through creation. I hope you knew I was going to say that one because I, I usually do. I think we see God's love in the creation around us. Um, John 3, 16 begins with the words that God so loved the world. It's not just humanity. It's all of the world that God loves because it's all part of his beautiful creation. I believe God takes great delight in the Appalachian Mountains. I think God takes great delight in the beautiful rivers that we have around us. I think God takes great delight in the fact that the majority of this planet is covered in salt water and we get to enjoy the beautiful aspect of the ocean. I think God takes great delight in eclipses and in sunrises and in sunsets. In fact, Genesis tells us that when God created he had a specific thing that he said as he created and he kept saying that he it was good that it was good i believe one way we can see the lavish love of god is around us in creation i think we can see the lavish love of god through other people have you ever had anybody love you have you ever had anybody be kind to you have you ever had anybody forgive you when you were just being a not good nice person Right? I think all of those are ways that we see the love of God in other people. I hope we can see a reflection of God in other people, but also to be reminded of this lavish love of God when we look at other people. But then I think we've got to see the lavish love of God when we look not only at other people, but when we look at ourselves. Yes, Jesus came and died for every other person on the world. But don't overlook the fact that Jesus loved and came and died specifically for you. There's that great little illustration. It's been around for a long time, but if you were the only person living on planet Earth, would Jesus had still come? And the answer is yes. God's lavish love is for you as well. I think we can see God's lavish love in Scripture as we read the Bible. I believe all of the Bible is pointing us towards the lavish love of God. Now, that's a big deal because there's some verses in the Bible that are difficult. Anybody ever read the Bible and you're like, wow, that's a hard verse? I hope every single person has, okay? But what I love from our Methodist understanding of theology, we have this beautiful thing called a quadrilateral. Quadrilat quad means four, and a Wesleyan quadrilateral simply means that as we try to understand things, that scripture is primary. It's the primary way we understand God and life and others. But that not only with scripture, but also with tradition, is how we can understand hard things. Tradition is the tradition of the church, not just tradition from like, you know, how your grandmama did things, although I'm sure that was wonderful, but tradition more of our early church fathers and the early church, the apostolic church is what we look at in tradition, right? We talk about our reason. God gave you a brain and we got to use it, especially when we read scripture. When you read something and you're like, how does that connect with the love of God? Then we got to work on that, right? And then our experience, and it's not just how we've experienced things, but it's the experience of the Holy Spirit in our lives and helping to guide us. Those are some ways. So I think all of Scripture points and shows us the lavish love of God. I think the cross is a beautiful picture of the lavish love love of God. John 3 16 says that God so loved the world that he did something. It's not just that he loved. Love always results in an action. God's love results in an action as well. And his action that John talks about um, in 3 16 when Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus is that God loved the world so he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. 
All of this lavish love of God does not just lead to behaving a particular way. There are over 600 laws in the Old Testament specifically for the Jewish people on exactly how they're supposed to behave. Jesus said that there are two that sums up all the law and all the prophets, in case you haven't heard these already today, and you need the reminder of what these two are. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourselves. Sometimes, though, we don't do that, do we? Or at least I don't, not completely. But the next part of this verse isn't just to see what great love the Father has lavished on us. It's that we should be called children of God. You're a child of God. Not if you do these things or if you don't do these things or if you follow these rules. You're a child of God because God loves you and God's lavished his love upon you. I can tell you personally, that a child who does not appear to love their father does not affect the father's love for that child. Are you all with me? A child who does not appear to love their father does not affect the father's love for that child. That's the lavish love of God that John wants us to see, that we should be called children of God. And that is what you are, John says, exclamation point remember at easter we talked about the little dot 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 the ellipse like the story continues that's not what john wants you to get here he wants you to get that you are children of god like exclamation point now that's an exciting thing that john wants us to see not that you will be a child of god not that you might be a child of god not if you behave a particular way you'll be a child of god but because god loves you you are a child of God. Now, we can choose to live outside of that love, can't we? Absolutely we can. Does that affect the love that God has for us? No. And that lavish love is available for all of us and every person in the world every day if we simply turn back to the love that God has for us. And that's a process. We call the process sanctification in our United Methodist theology. Sanctification simply means becoming more like Jesus. Our goal is to become more like Jesus. That's our life goal. Anybody got any goals this week that you want to do? All right, good. Tell me a goal that you have. Stick to a diet. Okay, great goal. Walk more. Good. Okay, here's the thing I think. I think all of us have goals some of those may be personal goals, um, walking more, how we diet, how we exercise. Uh, some of them may be work-related goals. I don't know if anybody has work-related goals. Maybe your boss is on you to really get something done, and you know that's a goal that you have for this particular week. Maybe it's just a goal at home. Today, my goal is, this week, my goal is to actually do laundry and do the dishes, both in the same week. Maybe that's a goal. It's a great goal. Maybe if you have children, your goal is simply, Lord, help me keep these little human beings alive one more week. And that's not a bad goal to have either, right? We've all got these goals. Maybe it's a spiritual goal to, to be more focused in your prayer or to read three chapters of your Bible a day or to read one verse of your Bible a day. Those are all good goals. But what I want to propose is this, that as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as ones whose God lavished lavished his love upon that our daily goal is to be more like Jesus. That's it. That's, one, that's, that's the top line goal for all of us. How do we do that? We do that by following the example and the teachings of Jesus to love deeper, to forgive, period, to give more freely, to be more available to people. And that's what we are living into as a child of God because we belong. You belong to God, and you belong here, because this is God's church. And you're not what you're going to be, because it's a process of sanctification. That's what John lays out for us. One day, you're going to be more than you are now. One day, you'll be complete. One day, John says, you will be like Jesus Christ even though we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but we're going to wait until Jesus is appearing, which means Jesus is second coming. Anybody believe that Jesus will one day come again? Okay, that's foundational to our 
um, understanding of God. I'm going to lead a Bible study at the end of this month on what does the Bible really say about the rapture. Anybody ever heard that word rapture? Heather and I were driving in Kingsport the other day, and we saw a, a church sign that said, um, if, if the rapture has happened, please change this church sign. Because I guess that meant that they wouldn't be there anymore. Um, and it's, I mean, I guess it's funny, right? It's supposed to be funny, but I, I think that's also a fearful statement too, okay? The Bible study I'll lead at the end of the month at 4 o'clock, we're going to look at um, some of these big words associated with the second coming of Christ, what we call the parousia. Um, we're going to look at things like the rapture. We're going to look at things um, like the apocalypse. We're going to look at things like the end of the world. I hate that phrase, the end of the world. Anybody ever read the book of Revelation? The world does not end. God created it in Genesis, and he said it is good. God redeems it all in Revelation and makes it perfect again. That's the whole point. That's an example of how God works in us. God created us and said, you are good. And then maybe if you're anything like me, we've had days where we messed up a time or two, and that through God's lavish love upon us, his patient grace that is with us every day, and this unbelievable, amazing, graceful forgiveness that God gives us, he keeps restoring us back into a relationship with him because he loves you and because you belong. Now, when John, John does address sin, I think that's important as well. John says that Jesus appeared the first time to take away all our sin. But then he says anyone who keeps on sinning doesn't really live in him or hasn't seen him or doesn't know him. I want to be honest with you. I sinned last week. Just to be straight up, right? I'm more than once. So it's important that we understand what John is talking about here when he's talking about this idea of, of sinning in um, this particular verse, that people who keep on sinning don't know who Jesus is. Sin for John is not breaking the rules. Sin for John is not, not doing what you're supposed to. Sin for John is I didn't follow these 600 Old Testament Jewish laws. Sin for John is denying that Jesus is the Christ, denying that Jesus is the Messiah, and not living in the love of God and love of other people. That's what we see in John's letter when he talks about sin. I believe sin at the basis of it is simply it's a lack of love for me. That's the way I understand a lot of sin. Sin is what separates us from God, but sin at a root is simply I didn't love God or I didn't love another person, and oftentimes it leads to this action or it leads to this thought. Because we are God's children, we don't have to behave in legalism to belong. We know that we belong, so we behave in love. I want to show you a video I saw, and it's from the Mennonite Church. It's like a one-minute video, but it's a poem um, that this particular poet had written about what it means to belong as a child of God. We have been saved by grace, and now we stand free. As children of God, we are one family. And although we come in many different shades, from the breath of God, we each were made. Hatred, confusion, pride, and defeat exist like weeds on our family tree. But we stand firm because we know who we are. Like a city on a hilltop, our lights shine far. You are my brother, and I will cover you. I will catch you when you fall, and I will pray for you. You, dear sister, I will love you the same. I will speak good of you and honor your name. We are a family under God's unfailing grace. Together as one, we will finish this race. Because I need you and you need me. One body, many parts, God's family. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I need you. I need you, I need you, you need me, we need each other. We are God's family, and together as God's family, we're going to finish the race that God has set out before us because of God's amazing, amazing grace. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks that your love is lavished out upon us. 
God, we give you thanks that your grace is amazing and abundant and beyond our comprehension, but your grace is a free gift, an unmerited gift that you have offered to every one of us. God, I thank you that you have called all of creation, all of humanity to be a family, and God, forgive us for the times when we fracture that, when we break that, when we ignore that, or when we brush that away. Forgive us, we pray, as your church. Help restore us into the unity of the body of Christ that you have called us to be. And fill us with your love that is lavished upon us. So then that we can finish the race that you have set before us. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn today is going to be Amazing Grace. It's on page 378 in your hymnal. Words are going to be on the screen. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 4. As always, the altar is open. If you'd like to pray, if you want to pray with me, I will. Just know you're a child of God. You are loved, and you belong. Please stand. Stand as you're able. <laughs> those early house churches they didn't they didn't have Vicky and Lisa leading everything they didn't have the screen with all the words sometimes when they felt the lavish love of God all they could say was praise God sometimes that's all we need to say is praise God I'm wondering as we the light of Christ is taken out if we could just maybe find a little hymn or a tune to praise God with So now, child of God, may you go with God's lavished love upon you, God's amazing grace filling you, and God's beautiful and perfect presence sustaining you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, and be blessed.